Hi, I'm Shane. And I'm Miranda. We're cheeky. Join us as we undertake our biggest road trip to date. Five months around Australia in a four-wheel drive. After a year of closed borders due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were finally able to travel from New Zealand to our closest neighbour, my home country of Australia. Each episode will take you to a different region in this diverse continent and get up close to its unique wildlife, camping in the outback and Aussie bush. If you ever wanted to explore Australia, this series is for you. In this episode... We explore the granite boulders of Porongaroop National Park before heading to the Stirling Ranges for one of Australia's best day hikes. Heading east, we visit the Fitzgerald River region during peak wildflower season. We head back to the southern coast to explore the granite landscape and some of the most beautiful beaches we have ever experienced around the Cape Le Grand National Park and Esperance. From there, we cross the limestone expanse of the Nullarbor Plains into South Australia. Join us on Global Travel Stories. Our previous episode took us from Fremantle to the Margaret River region with a stopover in Rottnest Island. It's a bit of a sun shower kind of day here at Prongarup National Park. Uh, about to do the famous granite skywalk up at Castle Rock. We were intending to do this yesterday, however, it was pouring down rain, so we took it down day. And uh, today we're heading up into the Stirling Ranges with a couple of little adventures along the way. Our hike took us up through stunning wildflowers during peak wildflower season, an added bonus for traveling in the spring. Porongarup National Park protects an extremely ancient mountain range formed in the Precambrian over 1200 million years ago, making the Porongarup Range the world's oldest mountain range. It is believed that the Porongarup Range is a remnant of the Precambrian collision that joined Australia and Antarctica until they separated in the Paleocene. The major granite intrusions are the remainder of what once must have been a large mountain range. Almost doesn't feel safe standing right underneath this. The granite skywalk in Parangurup sits atop a massive granite monolith named Castle Rock, 670 meters above sea level. The development of the walkway cost 1.5 million and officially opened in 2012. The trek leading up to the skywalk is 4.4 kilometers return and offers spectacular views over the national park. That's where we're heading this afternoon, the Stirling Ranges. So we're in the town of Mount Barker right now, we're just stopping for lunch and there is a bakery that we've been told you have to visit, it's an award winning bakery. So we're going to go in and check out some of these pies, have some lunch and then we're going to go up into the Stirling Ranges and do the famous scenic drive through the Stirling Ranges. Are you excited? Yay, very excited. Wildflower season. I don't normally do food reaction videos but this is pretty amazing. I got the surf and turf, this is steak and garlic prawns. They had so many different flavors. I'm even tempted to get another one. This is so good. The 
Stirling Range Drive is a scenic 42km unsealed road that winds through the heart of the park, taking in stunning landscapes with rugged peaks throughout. So we've just entered the scenic drive through the Stirling Ranges National Park. Absolutely stunning already. We can already start to see some of the wildflowers and I'm sure they're going to get better and better. We are at the first lookout, which is the Western Lookout. This is our road all the way through. It looks stunning. The plains in the Stirling Range region were the hunting grounds for small groups of indigenous Australians thousands of years before European settlement. The first recorded sighting of the Stirling Range by a European explorer was by Matthew Flinders on 5th of January 1802, while sailing along the south coast of Australia. Stirling Range National Park became Western Australia's third national park in June 1913. Just doing a small walk right now up to the central lookout. We're gonna get some beautiful views of the Stirling Ranges National Park and already you can see some of these beautiful wildflowers in here. Here we are at the top of the Stirling Ranges, right in the center here at the central lookout. A little bit of a climb, but I'll tell you what, absolutely stunning. After a couple of hours exploring the scenic drive, we arrived at our campsite at the Stirling Range Retreat in time for the birds to return for a spectacular sunset. distance, we could see our destination for a hike the next morning, Bluff Knoll. Today we're heading up there. That one there is called Bluff Knoll here in the Stirling Ranges. It's considered one of the top 25 day walks in Australia. Um, we'll head up to the top, we'll come back down and in the afternoon we're gonna head out to the Fitzgerald River. So the traditional indigenous Noongar name for Bluff Knoll is Bula Miao, and it means many eyes. So we have many eyes watching us right now. We're just gonna talk a little bit about some of those eyes. So, Australia is apparently one of the 12 countries in the whole world known as being mega diverse. It's home to over a million different plant and animal species, which is more than Europe and North America combined. Twice over. Twice over, more than double. So that's pretty impressive. Also, right here where we are in Southwest Western Australia, it is known as one of the top 25 biodiversity hotspots in the world. Pretty cool here, huh? It's pretty cool. And we're in a very unique place right now. This is a very cool environment compared to the rest of Western Australia. In fact, it actually snows 
here in the winter time. And when people think of Western Australia, you think of the desert, you think of the hot red sort of rocky sandy environment. We do have mountain ranges here, it does snow, and these uh, animals and plants that are adapted to this area here, here are very sensitive to changes in temperature, which is why climate change is such a huge issue. So you can see around me here all these burnt trees. These go back to the bushfires back in January 2020, beginning of last year, the really big ones that had global coverage. Over 40,000 hectares of this region down here in the southwest of WA were set alight and it was struck by a lightning storm, so it is a natural occurrence. However, because the uh, summers are getting drier and hotter, the winters are getting shorter and these are becoming more and more common. Absolutely devastating for the biodiversity around here. Looks like we've made it to the summit of Bluff Knoll. Not much of a view anymore. As you can see, we have lost our view. However, we did see the whole view pretty much on the way up. You can see the other side down towards the coast as well. And this is Pongarup National Park where we were yesterday. We made it, Chicky. Look at that. Beautiful views. Beautiful. At least we can see the car park down there. <laughs> We made it to the top and now it's time to head down. It's freezing cold, so after a few minutes of hanging out up there, it starts to really kick in. So it should probably be about an hour and a half or so back down and then we're heading off to the Fitzgerald River National Park. Here at the uh, Fitzgerald River National Park. We didn't quite arrive where we were planning to arrive. We were supposed to stay tonight at the St. Mary Inlet. However, the road was actually closed off because of the wet weather. There's a nice little homestead nearby, which is the Qualup Homestead or the Qualup Wilderness Retreat. Absolutely amazing. Tons of kangaroos around here. Tons of wildflowers. The drive in was just spectacular. Like the most we have seen so far on this trip, even more than Lazua National Park. This has a really cool little old homestead too from the 1800s. So we're gonna check that out. It's actually really cool. Brent is obsessed with the joeys right now. 1858. Ooh. Well, this is cool. It's like a little art gallery. Upon re-watching, we saw a strange shadow on the wall. We'll come back to this later. The music room. Interesting acoustics apparently. Definitely resonant. What do you think? That's how people lived back in 1858, Chicky. It's actually really nice. I could live like this now. All the wildflowers. <laughs> well, it's 170 years old. There's definitely ghosts in here.
John Wellstead built Qualop Homestead in 1858. The homestead was initially used as an outpost along with the barn which stored various crops. The Fitzgerald River National Park is under serious threat from Phytothora dieback disease. The disease can be carried by shoes as it spends its life in the soil. It causes root rot, which is a huge threat to the immense biodiversity of the region. So we did the nature walk and we also did the gorge walk. Um, apparently it's around about an hour and a half. I think we're a little bit less than that, but you could certainly take your time here and spend as much time as you like. It's kind of like uh, walking through somebody's garden right now, but the biggest garden you've ever seen. It's absolutely insane. They even did these sort of little signs underneath some of the trees. So some of the, the more significant flowers that you can read their names and all that sort of stuff. And also when they bloom. We're heading back to the homestead now. It's time to set up the tent and get ready for the evening. Since 2004, it has been owned by Karen and Karsten from Hamburg, Germany. The Qualop Homestead Wilderness Retreat sits on 40 acres of native bush surrounded by the Fitzgerald River National Park, including the original homestead itself, giving guests and visitors an impression of the early settlement days. Fitzgerald River National Park and then head to Point Anne and also climb Mount Barron. Unfortunately we aren't able to do any of those things today just because the road has been closed due to the wet weather over the past few days. Uh, the owner at our campsite did say that they might open the road at 11 a.m. It is now 11:20, so we have decided to um, give up on that plan and head to Esperance which is our next stop. Should take about four and a half hours. Alrighty, so we are at Dunn's Eco Park Camp, which um, looks pretty new and it's really, really impressive. We had to go through this sort of cattle station to get here and, you know, it was kind of strange at first getting here because there is nobody around, but now that we're settling in, I'm looking around these facilities and I think, we've got it pretty good right now. Um, we're just outside of Esperance. We were supposed to stay in Esperance tonight. The campground that we're planning to stay at was booked out and tomorrow we're going to the National Park, which is right next door to us, which is Cape Legrand. So, we enjoy a night here. We've even got a swing. Let's out the swing. Oh, by the way, I've got uh, some local beer. This is Lucky Bay Brewing. Lucky Bay is where we'll be going tomorrow in Cape Legrand. It's a blackjack. Oh, dearish. Look at this. I don't even know how this works. Am I supposed to sit? Ah, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to sit. Woohoo! Yeah! First stop in the National Park was La Grande Beach. 
to check out our campsite that we would return to later in the evening. So we're here at Cape Legron National Park and it's just outside of the town of Esperance in the southern part of Western Australia. We're about to climb up to the top of this granite peak up there called Frenchman's Peak. And the, uh, the granite mass that it actually sits on extends thousands of meters underground. It was formed 1,200 million years ago, 1,200 million years ago through molten rock magma activity below the surface of the ground and has since risen up above. About 40 million years ago, this was sitting at the side of the ocean, so down there at the coast, and the sea level is about 250 meters higher than it currently is today, so the waves used to just lap up and hit it, and it eventually eroded away this rock to become this sort of smooth surface boulder that it is right now. So I'm gonna climb up to the top and get some sweeping views of the national park, and then afterwards today, we're going to head down to Lucky Bay, which is a picturesque place where apparently kangaroos hang out on the beach. Interesting to see again. And then we will head to Cape Legron uh, campsite for the evening. So that's the plan for today. Miranda's looking at wildflowers. Kind of a steep walk up. Reminds me of doing some of the old domes in Yosemite National Park in the US. These really steep inclines on this granite surface. Views are spectacular. In the Aboriginal Dreamtime, two eagles, known as Wallach in the indigenous language, flew from Esperance to Cape Le Grand to nest and lay eggs. While the Wallach were out hunting for food, the nest was abandoned. Two children from a nearby camp were also left alone while their parents were out hunting. Disobeying their parents' instructions to stay at the camp, the children came across the nest and stole the eggs. When the mother eagle or Wallach returned, she saw the two children with her eggs Immediately, she picked them up and dropped them into the ocean. They became the nearby rocky islands at sea, and the mother Wallach became Frenchman Peak, watching over the sea in case the children ever returned to land. down here at Hellfire Bay and is that not the most beautiful beach you've ever seen in your whole life? This place is absolutely stunning. I thought we've already seen the best beach in Australia but apparently not. We are so lucky to be here on such a beautiful day. It has been raining pretty much the whole last week so it's yeah it's a miracle basically. Except for the flies. There is one drawback, this water is icy cold. <laughs> but when it's this beautiful, you can't really resist. <laughs> it's like rolling waves of glass, it's really, really cool. Oh. 
sooner or later, I'm just gonna have to do it. So I don't know about you, Miranda, but in my opinion, hands down, WA has the best beaches in Australia. What oh, do you think? Well, absolutely. Yeah? I agree. Yeah. yeah. I know so I know Queensland gets a lot of uh, rap for uh, having the best beaches, and they are pretty amazing. In their own right, each state has really amazing beaches, but so far, blown away by WA beaches. They're just stunning, out of this world, right? Absolutely. I have to 100% agree with you on that one. <laughs> Windy today, but the most beautiful beach in the world is right here. It's always been here, didn't even know. It's called Lucky Bay. The name was given by Matthew Flinders, who was the first man to circumnavigate around Australia. In 1802, there were some rough storms off the coast here, and his ship sort of pulled in at Lucky Bay and anchored down, found a little bit of shelter. Breathtaking place. I don't know what he would have thought at the time, but a little bit better than any beaches that you'll probably find in his home country if you're not sure of it. And the type of sand we have here, the reason why it's so bright and white is this sand that comes from the granite. It's made up of quartz, which is kind of tough sand, but it's just so beautiful. I say tough sand as in it's hard, but it's not hard. It's, it's soft like it's soft like powder. It's just, it's just amazing. That was actually really cool. We went up to Whistling Rock where you could hear the wind whistling and the waves crashing against the reflections of the rock. It was, it was really, really cool. In the Aboriginal dream time, the Nyonga people here, they would talk about Walek, which was uh, an eagle who'd come and kidnapped two children for stealing her eggs. And the, they say the sound of the Whistling Rock is the ancestors crying for the two, two children that have been taken out to sea by the great eagle. We're heading down to a place called Thistle Cove right now, named by Matthew Flinders, who first circumnavigated Australia back in the 1800s. And it was named after his first mate, John Thistle, who discovered water nearby. To celebrate being on Thistle Cove, I got myself a specific beer. It's called Thistle Cove by Lucky Bay Brewing, and I'm gonna drink that one down here on the beach. It's paradise and it's empty. Upon leaving the park the following morning, we came across a carpet python, lazily making its way across the road. Pythons are non-venomous and these snakes have a non-aggressive reputation. However, it's always important to allow all wild animals distance and respect. So today we're heading to Esperance, but first we are visiting Stonehenge. <laughs> It is actually an exact replica of the Stonehenge in the UK as it would have been in 1950 BC. They've made it out of pink granite from the area and it lines up with the summer solstice. Cool. Check it out. <laughs> this is kind of cool. Can't even walk inside of the real Stonehenge now, there. So 
that was the Esther of Stonehenge. It's uh, pretty bizarre. It was uh, commissioned by the local, uh, one of the local granite mining companies. Bit of a gimmick, but it's kind of funny and cool. All right, we're heading on to Esperance. Esperance is renowned for its stunning coastline and pristine beaches. As the weather wasn't the greatest when we were visiting, we were more than happy with a few lookout points along the scenic drive. So we're here at Lucky Bay Brewing in uh, Esperance. You can see the wood fire oven behind us here, which we're gonna get very shortly some wood fire features. Um, I've got myself a tasting palette here, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go through some of these. This one here is the Honey Seltzer, so it's not actually a beer. It's made by fermented honey, corn, and also some of the wildflowers in the area. I already tried this one recently, and I know it's delicious, but I'm gonna drink it again. It is really, really refreshing. And oh. This is the chicken cream cheese chicken pizza and pumpkin mash. Pumpkin mash. Nice. Excellent. Let's dig in. How's the pizza, Chicky? Amazing. <laughs> so good. Pizzas are great. I forgot to mention what other beers I've got here. So I've got a, a German style Kirsch there. And also got myself a barley pale ale and the stout over there. I've already tried them all and they are almost as good as the pizza. to the 90 mile strain, so Australia's longest road. We have come up from Esperance today and heading to Baxter Rest Area where we'll be staying for tonight and tomorrow we'll be heading to the Nullarbor and crossing over again. Yeah. Yes, hey, South Australia. To South Australia, that's right. <laughs> Telegraph Station in Eucla, which is right on the border between Western Australia and South Australia. It was built in 1877 and it was a key part of the communication around Australia during the time. It was abandoned in 1927 because of a plague, a rabbit plague, 
that is, and they shifted the telegraph station further inland. It's kind of cool. They have all these ruins just sitting down here on the coast in the middle of nowhere, and this has been inundated in all this sand, so it's kind of lost in time. Interesting place. So now we're heading to the border and we will say goodbye to Western Australia after one and a half months or just over one and a half months um, heading to South Australia. This is going to be a bit of a tough border, not so much getting into South Australia but um, uh, Western Australia itself is actually not allowed people from South Australia coming over so the whole drive over we have not seen any cars pretty much going in the opposite direction. We did not make the same mistake this time as we did entering Western Australia so got rid of all our fresh produce it's a bit of an issue going between state borders here in Australia kind of bittersweet you know we're happy to be moving on to a new area but also as well we really love Western Australia and hope to get back here someday when things are a little bit easier to cross back and forth for now we'll be heading through a little bit easier than we expected. We didn't have to pull over and have any check for our food, which we didn't shop for because we thought we'd have to get rid of it like we did in uh, Western Australia. Oh well, we're here now, South Australia. The Bunda Cliffs extend for around 100 kilometers along the Great Australian Bight, forming the largest uninterrupted line of sea cliffs in the world. The cliffs range from 60 to 120 meters in height and can be viewed from several viewing points along the Air Highway, east of Eucla and west of Nullarbor Roadhouse. So we're at the Nullarbor Roadhouse. We've got in just after sunset and it's about nine o'clock or well, 8.30 I think right now. Uh, this is the latest sunset we'll experience on this whole entire trip being so far down south and just crossing the time zone as well. Yeah, so we're about to experience the Nullarbor Roadhouse which is a very famous sort of uh, iconic place in the Nullarbor and we'll just get to chill out for the afternoon, the evening I should say. Brenda's going, she's getting hungry. Also in South Australia right now they have the mask mandate, so we'll be wearing masks for the first time since Brisbane. Coming up in the next episode, we continue along the Great Australian Bight to Seduna, where we get into the water with some very playful sea lions and dolphins. After time spent with our new aquatic mammalian friends, we headed north via Port Augusta to the Flinders Ranges. From here, we hike through the Wapenna Pound, a prison-like crater formed by geological barriers. We head through the Barossa Valley, famous for its premium wine production, before a detour in the Adelaide Hills on our way to the South Australian capital city. We spend a couple of days in Adelaide exploring the markets and the beachside suburb of Glenelg.
Join us on Global Travel Stories. At Global Travel Stories, we want to hear what you'd like to see more of. Please leave a comment below and remember to like and subscribe for our big adventures coming soon. Thank you.